Want to nail engineering manager interviews at Mang and other top tier companies? You can. With USA's number one tech interview prep platform, we have 300 plus SMEs and instructors from top tier tech companies to help you land your dream job. We've helped thousands of engineers make their way into Mang. You could be next. To learn more, register for our free webinar. This is not going to be a coding interview, rather it's going to be kind of a test of your knowledge of a lot of different front end concepts. Um, some of those include things like API development, back end development, security, front end development, and database engineering. Um, so we're kind of just going to be going over those topics. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. So for the first section, just had a couple questions sort of surrounding API development. Um, so the first one I wanted to start off with, which is kind of a, I find a frequently used topic um, in kind of the, the full stack engineering space currently. Can you just tell me a little bit about the benefits and drawbacks of using GraphQL APIs versus REST APIs? Sure. So I personally don't have a lot of experience with GraphQL. I have messed around with it. I am familiar with some of the concepts. Um, and from what I understand, uh, GraphQL uh, has a specification where it allows the client to query for a specific set of data as per the spec, and that data will, will get returned. So there's greater flexibility in terms of the client is able to query for. So if you have perhaps more complex query needs, um, GraphQL might be a better choice. Uh, more traditional REST APIs, um, one thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, they, they are more widely used. Um, if you have engineers that already have deep understanding of those kinds of patterns um, and how to work with basic REST, it might be an advantage for your team to go with what, what, what your engineers have experience with. Also, if the, the kinds of queries that the client needs to do are, are more simple, um, it might not make sense to code against a GraphQL spec uh, where you'd have to do more work on the client side in order to um, request the same set of data instead of something more simple like a get if, if your application's um, query needs are more simple. Sure, yeah, I think that that totally makes sense. Uh, if, you, if you hadn't told me, I would have assumed that you knew quite a bit about GraphQL. So great on that <laughs> front. Um, yeah, in that case, um, just diving a little bit deeper into REST, since that seems to be more something that you're a little experienced with, um, what do you view as kind of just the, the core tenets of building REST APIs? It doesn't need to be exhaustive, but what are some things that come to mind as sort of the, the core principles behind it? Sure. Um, so I think the, the patterns around different verbs uh, I'm not sure exactly the, the terminology around there being like a core tenant for this. Um, no worries, but, just go for it. Yeah, but you have a concept of what a record is and, you know, a record has a certain set of data um, that you would have documentation around, hopefully. Um, when you make a put call, it should update that record as per whatever data is being sent. When you make a get call, um, it should return that same set of data. And when you make a post, um, you know people people use the posts in different ways, but um, it should make some kind of an update or create a new record. Um, and beyond that, um, you know there isn't anything that's really coming to mind in terms of core core tenants. Um, I think REST is pretty flexible. It's used in a lot of different ways. Um, so beyond that, you know, per the needs of, of your application, different things might make sense. Yeah, no, I think that I think that totally makes sense. Um, would you say it's more standard in uh, sort of in that REST API development space um, to have more of a stateful or a stateless um, 
sort of presentation to it. So if you are the front end, say you're you know working on the front end, reaching out towards a a back end or a server, um, would you more assume that given a REST API, you'll have stateless communication where you're not really keeping an ongoing connection, or uh, more of a stateful connection where you know there's lots of intermediary data being stored between requests? Uh, I would say that it is stateless, that each transaction is isolated, um, and that there isn't any intermediate state um, that, that might happen during an interaction. Yeah, definitely. I would totally agree. Awesome. So I guess jumping to a, a slightly different topic, um, but along, along the same lines of talking about these different kinds of API, um, and feel free to to mention if you don't have any experience with this, that's okay. Um, but I wanted to ask sort of what is gRPC? Um, because that's a similar, you know, on the same track of different kinds of APIs and, and ways that you might communicate between systems. Um, gRPC is pretty frequently used. Um, but if you're familiar with it, how do you think that that its usage differs from REST and from GraphQL? Um, I vaguely remember Googling gRPC a while ago, but I don't, uh, I don't remember the details. I know that it's pretty recent, um, pretty cutting edge technology that, uh, you know, has only been around for a few years, even more recent than GraphQL per my understanding, but I really couldn't, uh, I, I don't remember too much beyond that. No worries at all. Um, happy, you know, obviously not gonna hit on all of these, so no worries there. Yeah. Okay. I, I left case, it open in a, I left it in an open tab here. I'll, <laughs> for my own curiosity. Glad to hear it. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, happy to, happy to dive into just chatting about it if you want to after this. Um, but yeah, okay. So following that up, um, I wanted to go back a little bit to the, the same topic we were talking about in those core principles with sort of that statelessness. Um, wanted to hear a little bit about um, the different kinds of HTTP methods. So what kinds of HTTP methods would you consider to be adempotent? And also when would adempotent methods be used? So I guess, First things first, uh, if you could just give it a definition of, uh, you know, adempotency, that would be excellent. Uh, well, I guess, I don't know, uh, tomato, tomato, I, I've always pronounced it idempotent, but. Uh, <laughs> I, admittedly, I've heard both, but yeah, yeah. Either yeah. Way. Um, so, uh, put calls are idempotent. Uh, making the same put call multiple times should result in the same state um, mm -hmm. of, of whatever persistence is being used. Um, I guess I guess get calls are item potent because nothing is being modified. Mm -hmm. um, and I I don't think posts are item potent. Um, and I suppose deletes would be item potent because you can only delete a record once if you call it again, if you if you make the same delete call again, um, the, the record would already be deleted and, and the, the resulting state would, would be the same. Yeah, that totally makes sense. How would you describe the sort of, you know, the importance of the of the concept of um, idempotency or idempotency. Um, how do you describe the, the significance of that in terms of designing front-end systems that can query backends without unintended side effects? Um, I think as a general computer science uh, concept, it's hugely important um, because it's beneficial to know that when uh, certain action is taken, that you can be guaranteed to have a particular resulting state um, and so, you know, if, if, for example, there's a bug where something is getting called twice or three times, um, mm -hmm. you don't want that to potentially impact the integrity of your data. Um, it's, it's good to, to have that um, extra certainty that, uh, that, you know, no matter what, if, if something's happening multiple times, you know what the end result will be. 
Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. I think you summed it up quite well. Well, I just had one more question on these sort of, you know, HTTP calls, um, API development sort of uh, topics. So following that up, um, I kind of wanted to ask a little more about what is long polling and why is that beneficial to use? So when we're talking about HTTP long polling specifically. Yeah, my understanding of long polling is that um, it, if you open, a, if you make a rest call and some data isn't available yet, um, that instead of closing the connection and returning, um, returning some kind of empty, empty set or not available or something along those lines, that the connection will remain open until that data becomes available. So for example, if there's a messaging application, um, when you make a call to get a new message, um, if there are no new messages, the call will wait until a new message appears. Um, this could be beneficial in certain applications um, if mm -hmm. you know that that if you know that messages are going to be coming in with you know uh, relative amount of frequency, um, it might make sense to use long polling. Um, and you avoid the overhead of having to use um, what I guess you could call normal polling, where when an empty result gets returned, you continuously make calls um, until uh, you, know, you, you receive some kind of an update. So you don't have the overhead of making many calls um, and querying over and over if you're using long polling in those cases. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so considering that long polling is kind of used to establish this sync or um, synchronous or, you know, maybe pseudo synchronous connection between the, the client and the server, are there any other, you know, technologies or implementations um, that allow you to achieve a similar effect as long polling that might, you know, have benefits or drawbacks compared to it? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is web sockets, um, where communication can uh, a, a connection stays open and communication can come from the server instead of the client always having to initiate communication. Um, there is added complexity in, um, in implementing uh, something with web sockets. Um, there are additional concerns you might have to, um, to address, uh, but the added benefit is that um, you're not limited to uh, making a single request and waiting for a single response and then initiating another request. So if you have an application where um, you want the server to be able to make updates on the client and there's going to be more complex communication between the client and the server, and it makes sense to, to maintain a connection and allow that um, communication to happen in both directions, um, then it might be better to use uh, web sockets. Whereas if the uh, communication that's happening is a bit more simple um, and there is only say one piece of data or, or um, you know, some smaller set of data that you might be waiting for, uh, perhaps it would make more sense to use long polling. It's more likely easier to implement. Yeah, I would completely agree. I think that, um... That's kind of a challenge with with web sockets in particular is that implementing them it gets pretty hairy because you have to worry about a lot of you know browser support issues and other you know complications with developing over a pretty specific and less supported system whereas multi or um, whereas long polling kind of just fits in there awesome well in that case um Figured we'd take this time to jump from more API development focus to more backend engineering questions, um, focusing a little bit more on that domain, um, starting with just some super general questions um, and maybe working our way to a little bit more specific. So um, on that note, I guess just to start it off, um, could you explain what the difference is uh, between a thread and a process in, in any kind of, you know, backend system or in any running language? Sure. Uh, I guess, you know, more generally in, in an operating system, um, mm -hmm. 
uh, a process is can can contain multiple threads of execution. Um, the way I would think about it is that um, a process is some kind of uh, application or um, you know coordinated group of threads uh, that would share memory and and, um, and have access to uh, the same memory as as the OS is um, is sharing resource across multiple processes. A thread mm -hmm. within a process is a uh, it's one line of execution. It's one one thread, for lack of a different word, of execution. Where, um, if you have some code that's uh, being executed, um, it's happening in a certain order, and that is is um, that what's happening in that particular set of instructions that's being uh, executed within the process um, would be a, a single threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you I think you totally summed it up. I think, yeah, the key difference there being that just having that shared memory space versus um, actually splitting off the resources. I wanted to kind of follow up with that with um, Generally speaking, how would you explain the concepts of um, multi-threading? Because we um, obviously, since we're able to run these threads sort of in parallel to increase execution speed, that's excellent. But how how would you go about you know, both what is multi-threading and how would you go about um, implementing it into a single threaded system? How do you go about implementing multi-threading into a single threaded system? That is an interesting question. Kind of assuming that you had, you know, some application that was currently right. running on one thread. Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is Node.js, um, mm -hmm. where it is a single threaded um, execution. However, uh, there is the, the way that asynchronicity is handled. Um, could be considered kind of multi-threading in a single threaded system. Uh, now, let me think for a little bit a better answer. Uh, no, it totally makes sense. So I guess you can reinterpret it as if you had, um, let's say you just wanted to implement multi-threading, you know, in a, in a language that supports multi-threading, but you're just not using it currently. Oh, Say something like you know, Java or Python or. Even oh, are you like are C. you? Is this question? Are you asking about mm -hmm. um, like what? How how? Let's say an an operating system only has a single execution thread. The, the CPU only has a single core. How would yeah. an application with multiple threads be able to execute in that runtime environment? Is that what the question is? No, sorry. I think there's been. I think there's a little confusion. It's more just, um, you know, obviously applications, let's assume we're running on, you know, on a machine that has multiple threads, um, okay. but we're currently in an application that, um, you know, has only been structured to support oh. a single threaded execution. Okay. What are the kind of, you know, uh, specifically keeping an eye on what are the kind of, you know, systems that you'll need to have in place would it, be kind fair, of... would it be fair to replace the word system with the word application sure i, I think that makes sense okay yeah so imagine on a multi-threaded system switching from a single threaded to a multi-threaded application okay yeah. um so more more generally the concept of multi-threading is just being able to have the ability to do different things simultaneously um, so if there are different parts of, of your application that you want to be able to run at the same time, um, mm -hmm. you would use multi-threading. Um, and 
you know, as to whether that's actually happening at the same time, um, it would be system dependent, uh, you know, whether or not each individual thread is actually executing at the same time it has to do with um, the way the processor works, but I don't think that's uh, necessarily relevant to this question. Um, if you had an application that was single threaded, but you saw opportunities for performance improvements where, um, you know, for example, there's a long running task where, you know, you were waiting for, um, you know, some kind of output uh, before doing something else where it's actually possible to do those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to, to restructure your code so that um, those two separate tasks have their own execution threads. Um, and, you know, how you'd go about implementing that would be um, to look for those kinds of opportunities within your, your application, uh, examining the code and, and seeing where the bottlenecks are and where there might be opportunities for, for performance and improvements that would leverage multi-threading if you could do things simultaneously. And once you find those kinds of opportunities, um, then refactoring, restructuring the code so that those things do actually execute on separate threads. Um, you know, there are concerns that you have to be aware of. Um, you know, you can get things like locking. Um, there's also added complexity uh, dealing with multiple threads. Um, you have to deal with certain concurrency issues that might happen if there's a, a reference to a shared object across two threads. Um, it's possible for there to be uh, subtle, subtle bugs and issues that that come up um, when you're doing things concurrently. Um, but you know, assuming that you had ways to handle that, um, you would uh, you'd be able to improve the performance by leveraging multi-threading. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I kind of wanted to dive a little bit deeper into one thing you said, which is that you know one of the the things that come up is the is the need for for the potential for for locking. Um, could you just explain what you meant by that a little bit more? So, um, in in Java, for example, um, there are different ways to handle concurrent execution and multi-threaded access to the same object. So suppose you have a reference to a single reference, uh, a single object um, in memory, and there's more than one thread that may be modifying the state of this object. Um, it's possible for there to be issues where one thread obtains a lock on, you know, it could be a field, it, it could be um, whether or not a method, a single method is allowed to execute concurrently. Um, and if a thread obtains a lock, that means that any other thread must wait for that thread to release the lock and say, you know, I'm no longer, um, you know, using this object in whatever way. And it's possible for there to be issues where um, a thread obtains a lock and for some reason it doesn't get released or it takes a long time to get released. And all the other threads uh, would have to wait for that to happen before they'd be able to, to perform some kind of operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's totally a good explanation. I think, you know, the lock ends up just being a tool that you use that, um, you know, ensures that you don't have unintended interactions between the threads um, and, you know, merges them or, you know, splits off their execution in appropriate sense. So awesome. Sounds great. Um, glad, glad we got through that one. Um, following it up kind of with um, a little bit more about, I know we've been talking a little bit about sort of specific programming languages and the, the nuances of each. Um, but just wanted to dive into if you could explain the uh, cut off one word, if you could explain the difference between what a static and a dynamic programming language is. Are, are you talking about static and dynamic typing? Yep, typing. Okay. Yeah. 
um, in a static, statically typed language, um, when you uh, declare a variable, you must declare its type. And the type of that variable cannot change uh, later on. Um, in a dynamically typed language, you can reassign uh, different types to the same variable. And that's allowed uh, a very uh, a reference to, to something can start out as an integer and then and then become a string or you know and anything uh, anything you want. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, what are kind of the the benefits and drawbacks of, of using each? Um, I would say uh, benefit of using a statically typed language um, is uh, you you have a kind of consistency because and and you know the these aren't the same thing but static statically typed languages I think are more often compiled languages um, mm -hmm. so you get uh, some of the benefits of a compiler where you know certain things about a variable when you declare it you know what the type is um, and therefore when you're when you're developing or, or certain issues can come up during compilation instead of runtime which is at advantageous um, if you're um, accessing something the wrong way or, or you you make a mistake as about what type a particular variable is um, I'd say a benefit mm -hmm. a benefit of a uh, dynamically typed language um, is there may be valid cases where you want to change the type of you know uh, an argument to a method or or, or allow an argument to be um, different types or a variable to be different types. Um, you know, there are valid cases where um, that might be advantageous for your application logic. Um, you know, you know that you can treat, treat you know, some set of types in a certain way, and you might have, uh, you might have a more e elegant solution to something because of that. So it allows more, more freedom, more flexibility um, for the developer if they, if they want to uh, use different types on the same variable. Yeah, I think I think that makes complete sense. Um, I guess, yeah, I think that the difference does ultimately come down to a lot of that similar but but different concept of compiled versus interpreted, um, which end up being that the compiler is there mostly, not mostly, but you know, largely to do that type checking. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, obviously, when you don't have to do that, you get a lot more flexibility at the risk of some amount of bugs, um, or at least the potential for them. Awesome. That was all I had, at least for now, um, for the backend questions. Um, so next up, I kind of wanted to dip or uh, kind of wanted to dive into some of the general front end development questions. So for this, going to be taking a slightly different approach. Um, just wanted to get your opinion on some issues that would come up during a regular sort of session of front end development or during a project. Um, and kind of just wanted to know what your, what mitigations you might look into using or what your, you know, immediate first steps would be if you encounter these issues. So for that, I'll go ahead and paste this in here. Um, so for the following issues, how would you go about diagnosing and mitigating their effects in a full stack application? So let's say that you made a change um, that increased the size of the network requests or a change that appeared to do that anyway. And suddenly your application is facing very long network requests from the front end. What kind of, um, you know, what would be your approaches to try to speed up your application um, after finding that this had suddenly occurred? So just to, just to clarify, um, you have a front end and it's making some calls and you know, the, the API is very slow to respond. Um, and you're wondering what you can do on the front end to try and mitigate the impact of that. Mm -hmm. Let's say that some long network requests were added, 
to the front end, um, and it's decreasing overall application performance for whatever reason. Um, and yeah, what what kind of mitigations would you would you generally look to make there? Um, well, for starters, you have to make you you have to be certain that those calls are happening asynchronously. Um, and I guess the front end doesn't necessarily have to be JavaScript. Um, you know, the the pattern of of making uh, calls in JavaScript is um, asynchronous, uh, or mm -hmm. I guess you can do it synchronously, but that is almost always a, a bad idea. Um, but I would make sure that that waiting that that these requests aren't blocking the execution of other things that that might be happening or um, preventing you from updating the state of of the ui so that if the user wants to do something else while these requests are happening that they are able to do so and that the, the application would still be responsive um, it's not it's not blocking um, aside from that uh, you know there aren't really too many things that are coming to mind um, in terms of what you can do on the front end from you know technical perspective I think um, you know there are things you can do from a UX perspective to try and um, to try and make the user aware of why something might be slow or um, improve the the look or the feel of, of what's happening while these while you're waiting on these requests um, but uh, in terms of what you can do technically on the front end, uh, nothing else is coming to mind. No, I think that totally makes sense. Um, how would you maybe approach it? Is there anything that comes to mind if you found that this, you know, you implemented one long network request and it appeared to be working just fine, but upon inspection, you're finding that it's getting called repeatedly. Um, if it if it was instead a problem of the network request getting called, you know, say multiple times. Um, is there anything you would you would do then to try to mitigate it? Uh, yeah, I mean, then you would start debugging. Um, so, you know, if, if you're, let's say this is a browser-based application and you're using a web browser that has uh, uh, developer tools that, that give you insight into what's happening with your networking and, and with calls that are being made, um, you can look at that and try to see, um, you know, whether or not your application is making unnecessary requests or whether there's an issue with how the client is is making it, its calls um, and if you look at the network tab um, and you see that it's requesting unnecessary data or it, like you said it's um, making a request repeatedly which is unnecessary um, then you would start debugging and try to understand why that's happening on the client side and hopefully um, be able to resolve that so that um, you're not placing unnecessary load on your server or making unnecessary calls. Mm -hmm. Totally makes sense. Following up on something I, that I think you said um, with, with the debugging, um, how would you instead mitigate it if the issue was not long, res not long network requests, um, but say you were using a framework such as Vue or React or something along the same lines, and you just found that you had a lot of excessive component re-rendering. How would you maybe tackle, um, you know, mitigating that? Where would you look? Where would you look to fix that? Um, well, again, you you would have to look at the logic of your um, application components. And for example, in React, um, a component gets re-rendered whenever its state is modified. Um, and you would have to see why the state is being modified um, so much and try to, um, it, it often happens in, in React where there's a, a loop of some kind where you modify state in one way, which triggers logic that, that modifies state in another way. And you, you can end up in a, in a cycle where um, those two things might just be going back and forth. And um, that would be excessive re-rendering. Um, you know, if every time it tries to update the state, more state changes are made, um, you'd have to look into your application logic and try to understand why, why that's happening and, and how to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense.
Um, I think that's a perfectly, you know, reasonable way to go about addressing it. Um, and definitely agree with what you said about state. That is usually the cause of, you know, the excessive re-rendering, at least in React, is usually those state changes that end up just getting called too often, too many props shifting at once. Um, and then, yeah, that causes that, you know, excessive re-rendering and then things like running these long network requests multiple times. Uh, yeah, and then I just had one more. Um, so how would you mitigate the effects of large asset sizes? So let's say that you incorporated some kind of large asset onto your site, either, you know, say very high resolution images, videos, things like that. Um, well, assuming that the asset can't be compressed um, and you want to um, serve this large asset to the user, um, again, you would make sure that requesting this large asset is not, is not blocking, that, um, that other things, other UI changes can occur at the same time as this asset is being downloaded. Um, another thing that uh, you could do in the case of a video, um, you could uh, serve the asset in multiple parts and um, allow there to be a buffer um, that, that loads, for example, the beginning of the video so that the user can begin watching the video while the rest of it gets loaded um, and they don't have to wait um, for the entire thing to be downloaded um, in order to start for example, watching the video. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. Awesome. Well, with that, um, about done with the front end development questions. Um, we do have a couple more topics to go over. Um, so first off, wanted to start with uh, a couple questions about database engineering as well. Um, just as you know, Sort of the the third major pillar here between the uh, the back end and the front end development is definitely the database engineering as well. So starting off with a relatively straightforward one, um, wanted to ask what your definition of a database transaction would be, um, and how the sort of ACID properties relate to ensuring safe transactions and making sure that all data in, in your database is uh, consistent, up to date. So how I would describe a database transaction is it is a set of changes or actions um, that are, are grouped such that if any failure occurs, um, none of the changes um, are persisted. Um, so if you have a banking application, um, you know, and you need to both, you know, let's say if there's one person that pays another person, um, you have to ensure that, that the balance that gets deducted from one account and added to the other account that, um, either both of those things happen or neither of them happen. Um, otherwise, um, so, so if there's some kind of failure, you don't accidentally only subtract some balance or only add some balance. Um, ACID properties uh, have to do with um, really having a, a resilient database uh, that can handle all sorts of failures um, and still maintain the integrity of the data, um, which is more often than not the heart of your application um, and how they relate to ensuring safe transactions. Um, you know, there are all kinds of different reasons some failure might happen within a transaction. You could lose power um, or, you know, you could have a disk that gets disconnected or, um, you know, there, there are lots of different things and ACID ensures that um, if, if the database adheres to ACID principles and properties, um, that, uh, that the, the integrity of the data will be maintained. Yeah. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, definitely agree. I 
I think that the asset principles kind of build right into that initial definition you gave it the transaction where it's you know something that is enabled to be rolled back if anything goes wrong. It's sort of a single um, separate piece, a uh, single separate change in a database um, such that we have total control over you know what happens at each step when we are changing things. Awesome. Talking about consistency, um, kind of wanted to jump to another topic about, or another question regarding that consistency. Um, so again, why do people typically use distributed databases? And could you explain briefly what could go wrong regarding consistency in a distributed database versus one that is not distributed and is just in a single, um, you know, say a single table or a single, you know, server? Uh, people typically use distributed databases in order to improve scalability. Um, a single server or a, a single table can only handle so much traffic. Um, and if you want your application to be able to scale to a very large number of, of users, um, it's important that uh, your database is able to handle that amount of traffic. And if it's on a single server, um, the, the point at which it, it won't be able to handle the traffic is a much lower than if you're able to um, distribute the database across multiple servers. Um, what could go wrong? Uh, if it, there are constraints that you may have for your data, um, and there are certain conditions and properties that you want to ensure are met. Um, and in a distributed database, it's often more difficult to um, ensure that those constraints are being met across all of your data. So um, if there's a table that gets distributed across several servers, and suppose one of the columns in, in, in that table you want to have uniqueness for, um, you know, depending on the database implementation, that's either gonna slow things down or it's, it's not gonna be supported across the different shards of your database. Um, and so you could end up with um, inconsistent data um, or you could end up, uh, having issues with those types of constraints. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And then also, you know, those those are all problems that you wouldn't really occur if you were just doing a single server implementation. Because um, yeah, the the issue of getting to those, getting to the inconsistency between the different shards of different servers really just can happen when you're having that single transaction model that we talked about. Awesome, that makes sense. So one more question about databases, uh, as we are pretty close to um, pretty close to the end, and I did want to cover at least one more topic after this. So um, for for our last question here, could you just briefly describe the difference between a SQL and a NoSQL database, or SQL no SQL, and give some example scenarios of their usage? Um, sure. Uh, so SQL. Um, follows a relational model, um, whereas NoSQL um, could be a document store, it could be something else that doesn't adhere to, um, or at least doesn't completely adhere to a relational model. Um, if you have uh, data that has lots of um, relationships and constraints and um, you know, different um, different sets of data are all related, uh, then it might make more sense to use SQL and a relational model. Whereas if all you have is a bunch of documents or something where the data is not highly related, um, you don't need to check certain constraints or that many constraints um, when you're making changes, uh, it, it could be better to use um, NoSQL.
Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, can you think of any sort of example scenarios where you might choose to use uh, a NoSQL database over a SQL database? Sure. Um, so if you have, um, let's say it's an application that is storing uh, a bunch of text documents. Um, and so users are able to create some number of documents um, and store you know text notes whatever they would like um the the bulk of the data there are the content contained in the documents and because that uh is isolated to a document it's not related to other documents um it it might make more sense to use uh no sequel instead of a relational model yeah, totally agree. I think that's the very standard use case for for NoSQL generally storing, you know, things as documents rather than things in tables, just because you, know, you can group them by certain properties, but generally you're not going to be able to sort them into that, the nice exact clean data that you have in a SQL database. Awesome. So had at least one more question I wanted to ask before the end, um, jumping to the, the one topic we really haven't covered at all, which is security. Um, and for this one, I wanted to start super raw, just to give you a little bit of room to, you know, talk about a couple different strategies. So um, just briefly explain what some of the protections that might be used to store a password securely in a database. Are. Um, so say you were designing a new system and you wanted to be able to take a password, you know, typical username password combo from a user and take their password and store it securely. How would you, how would you go about doing that? Um, well, you would most likely want to use a hashing function uh, so that the password itself is not stored. You're, you're applying some kind of a hash um, so that if, uh, if a malicious uh, user ever did gain access, um, they wouldn't have the user's passwords um, because with the right hashing function, it's impossible to reverse engineer and uh, take the output of the hashing function and be able to find the corresponding input. Um, you'd also want to um, adhere to more basic things like um, principle of least privilege um, and you know other things, um, having proper authentication so that um, so that when the user's typing in their password or um, you know who who is able to to I guess um, listen in on that is restricted as much as possible. Awesome. Makes sense. Yeah. And then following up, wanted to ask one more question before we wrap up. Um, so if you can, um, could you briefly describe OAuth as well as what its purpose and you know generally how it works. Don't need a full flow chart, but you know, just the, the rough yeah. steps. Um, so OAuth is a uh, authentication standard um, and it has a specification um, where there is uh, some kind of a trusted uh, third party uh, that generates an authentication token, um, which can expire um, and that instead of um, uh, directly you know, sending your access credentials anytime you're um, interacting with some application, you can use a token that's generated by a trusted third party and the application can verify that um, the properties of this token match up with uh, you know, your your credentials and, and the communication happens between a user and some trusted third party as well as the application and that in that trusted third party. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think that that totally makes sense. Um, that's a great way to describe it. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's not authentication in the same way as, you know, um, sort of password based logging or multi factor and it's rather sort of a specification for a system of providing your credentials to a third party um, via you know, a temporarily expiring token. 
Awesome. Well, with that, uh, we have about eight minutes left of our time in the interview. So I'll go ahead and call it there. Um, we got just about to the end of the of the questions that I had intended to ask. So awesome on the timing there. And yeah, so with that, I'll go ahead and give you some initial feedback. Um, Wait, if you, if, if you had more questions, um, do you just that you were intending to ask? Do you mind just pasting them just for my own curiosity? Absolutely. Um, it was actually just here. I'll uh, I'll paste them in. I had three more security questions, but I did, I intended to leave the security for the end. Um, yeah, just not, because that's the most you know the the least helpful I think to the overall interview and also the most niche. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, I pasted in one of the wrong ones. Give me one second. There we go. Okay, so those were the three remaining ones, kind of more niche topics in security engineering. I guess not super niche, but um, I've never heard of cross site scripting that really. yeah. and auth versus auth. Yeah, they're essentially designing roles for, um, you know, different ways of designing roles for a system uh, via, you know, specifications. Sure. But yeah, anyway, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give some initial feedback and then give you some space to ask questions. So, um, overall, I think you did really excellent. Um, this is definitely on, you know, I would say you're, you're in the range for that, that four, um, four out of four kind of like over the top candidate, um, just because you really had pretty well put together answers for almost all the questions. Um, obviously there were, you know, one or two, yeah. um, that could have been improved. Um, I, I wouldn't give a four. as an interviewer, I wouldn't give myself a four. <laughs> I think that, um, yeah, most interviews, interviewers end up, I think, grading on kind of that curve. So it's about not necessarily whether you're able to answer every single question, but how many you answer relative to the mean. Um, I, and I, would, I would definitely my... say, go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say you're, you're currently in the, in the top 10%, um, at least for, for this interview category. Um, which is generally where I draw that line of in, you know, above average, excellent candidate, as opposed to just the pass. Um, okay. Where, yeah, I more generally would define the pass as sort of not the, as much on a curve, more like, did they get, you know, three quarters of it to a solid answer kind of thing. Um, anyway, the, the things to work on, I think, um, were mostly the API development at the beginning. Um, you know, I think you did pretty well. Um, but yeah, the GraphQL answer, I think, um, could have probably been improved with a little more knowledge of the system. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously not knowing what gRPC is not a huge deal. Um, it is a relatively newer technology. Um, but yeah, is in frequent, pretty frequent use as sort of more of a communication between backend systems, especially in combination with like, you know, communicating between your different backend systems that are hosted on Kubernetes pods. I know there's a lot of interaction there. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And then for the, um, yeah, I think that that was most of the, um, the question. There was also the um, asset properties in the database transactions. I think you could have gone into a little more detail there. Um, I agree with that. I also yeah. wasn't happy with my own answers about multi-threading. Yeah, I think the, the multi-threading also could have been improved a bit. Um, but the ones that I thought you did really well on um, were both the, right at the end, I thought the OAuth. Wait, is um, this? Yeah, feel free to also, it, it'll stay in the code bunk, but feel free to copy it or, or use, and yeah. use this however you want. Um, yeah. You'll also get a recording of it later. But um, yeah, I would say that the ones you did really well on, um, right at the end, the OAuth question, uh, I think really highlighting that it is a, you know, a specification with implementations is something that people miss a lot. It's, you know, they treat it more as like, this is a technology. Um, just the, the little use of language was really nice there. Um, as well, I thought the front end development questions um, with the, the different use cases of, you know, how would you go about mitigating this? Um, I thought those were well thought out answers as well. Um, just kind of the way you worked through them, especially I thought was good um, because you kind of started with, you you kind of 
walked through how you would debug them a little bit, um, which is definitely good to see, as opposed to saying, well, this is probably caused by this issue, um, which I think gives less insight into how you would think about these problems in a, in a real setting. Um, but yeah, with all that said, um, you know, going to write up some more involved feedback as well as some, some more involved scoring and give that to you in the feedback um, that'll get back to you. So in the last couple of minutes here, do you have any questions for me? Um, so this is the first mock interview. And I think that these kinds of higher level questions, I tend to do a little bit better on than mm -hmm. the coding kinds of interview uh, interviews. Um, so I'm wondering, um, like what what are the different kinds of mock interviews? How do I uh, how do I make sure that I'm uh, covering all my bases in terms of the different types of interviews that'll that could happen um, where you're actually asked to code or uh, like how how do I schedule different kind of interviews so that it's not always just these kinds yeah. of questions? Absolutely, I am more than happy to help with that. Um, I guess first I was just checking. Okay. Um, so what kind of roles would you be applying to? Because I think that's helpful in narrowing down which which interviews would be the most helpful. Uh, full stack roles um, at top companies, basically. Makes sense. Do you have an idea of like seniority level roughly? Because the I would say the higher up you go, um, I guess you'll have to probably take them regardless. I would just say that the um, we have a lot of interview topics that are essentially um, different kinds of those data structures and algorithms interviews. Um, I would say that's a majority of the topic are focusing on those because those are tend to be the most common and the ones people mean the most help with. Yep. Um, so things like recursion interviews, trees interviews, graphs interviews, those are all going to be some variant of, you're going to sit down and solve a lead code problem at a, at a varying level of difficulty. Okay. Um, and then we also have both the um, system design and now the front end system design. Um, where if you're going for full stack engineering, I think um, both honestly might come up. Um, kind of the difference between, um, you know, designing systems with an emphasis mostly on sort of database and backend interaction mm -hmm. versus designing systems with an emphasis on, you know, sort of framework usage and, and BFF layers and things like that. Um, so, so there are basically different categories of problems that I can choose between for the mock interviews. I can say, okay, I want to work on uh, uh, if I pick a recursion or graph, or you know, each topic essentially has its own category of mock interview, and I can say I want to do those. Those are, um, you know, the where I'll actually be solving a problem or doing system design. Um, you know, I'll be asked to actually design something. Um, and those are categories mm -hmm. I can choose from uh, uh, for the mock interview. Yep, exactly. You got it. So okay. there's kind of, there's roughly, oh, what is there? Four categories, I think. In so there's the, yeah, go ahead. Uh, there, there's essentially ones that are uh, technical interviews. So the sit down lead code, there's system design, which is sit down, design a system. Mm -hmm. um, there's behavioral, which is sit down, tell me about your prior work experiences and you know how you work in a team setting. Um, and then there's uh, sort of the high level overview ones, which I think are this, and then there's one other similar front end engineering interview um, that does okay. the same thing. So okay. those, are, those are the four kinds. I see. So technical interviews, what I'm talking about was what I was saying, um, we actually do a problem, something like yep, a- Yep, exactly. Um, the seniority level, you know, depending on the company, probably senior to lead would be ideal, would be what I'd be applying for. Um, I have about eight years of experience, so I don't know yep. how that impacts what, um, what I would uh, choose for the next mock interview or if you have any suggestions around, um, you know, this or, or other things for IK. Totally makes sense. That's like definitely a, a pretty common range for, for people in our courses to be in. Um, I would honestly just recommend both the um, the behavioral to not skip the behavioral or the system design. Um, I think that the the technical, you know, lead code style interviews are very important. Um, yeah. But oftentimes the the learners end up, 
um, kind of uh, drilling those too much um, and then neglecting both behavioral and um, system design, which I think are, are both quite important. Okay. So mostly technical, but don't neglect to do the others, basically. Yeah, I would, I would say something like a, a probably focus, you know, 60 to 70% on those technical interviews and then have the other 30 to 40% split between system design and behavioral. That would be my suggestion. Or, and then this falls into that 30 to 40% category, this full stack, higher level kind of question. Yep, exactly. Okay. Yeah, these, these interviews tend to fall a little bit after, you know, kind of an initial screening process, um, but before they're going too deep into the weeds with, you know, giving you a, a very intensive system design interview. I see. Okay. Well, great. Um, this was helpful. I appreciate it. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to, glad to be of service. Thank you. That's, that's very kind. Uh, I appreciate it. Awesome. You as well. Uh, have a good one. Thank <laughs> you.